they can all liberals can manage to say right now after like 70 children have been vaporized and you know hundreds of civilians have been vaporized and they're, they're you're just watching towers fall down and they're all saying well israel has a right to defend itself so they don't have a problem with violence at all they have no problem with terrorism they have no problem with violence they have no problem with violence against civilians but there's like a standard that Palestinians are supposed to uphold. And in exchange for what? Again, like you can ask that. You can. If you're like, look, you guys take the hits. We'll take hits too. You know, we'll go to jail on your behalf, whatever. Like we're, but as a solidarity movement, there's, I'm, that's not happening. Welcome to the Recovery and Transformation Podcast, the show that links personal health with societal well-being. I'm your host, Samir Dosani. I'm an activist, a PhD student, and a health coach based out of Johannesburg, South Africa. This show explores the root causes of disease and talks about how people are recovering and transforming every day. Hi, and welcome to another podcast. If you enjoy this content, please do remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment wherever you're listening to this. My guest today is Toronto-based writer and scholar Justin Poder. Justin's written a number of books, but the one we talk about here is his 2019 novel Siege Breakers, which is a thriller set in Gaza. Justin and I never met when I lived in Canada, but we've gotten to know each other through our work, and I was on his podcast a few months ago talking about my work on colonialism. In this interview, Justin shares some of his personal story of becoming a political activist, but we spend most of the time analyzing current events in Palestine. Before we begin, I just wanted to read this quote uh, that I've been thinking about a lot as I watch the bombs fall in, uh, in Gaza. It's part of a declaration drafted in 1955 and signed by a number of scientists, uh, Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell being perhaps the most prominent among them. They write that there is a stark option facing all of us, quote, Shall we put an end to the human race, or shall we renounce war? Sixty-six years after they wrote these words, as we watch the bodies of children being pulled from the wreckage, it's a question we all must continue to ask ourselves. So without further ado, my conversation with Justin Poder. Justin Poder, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. <laughs> Thank you, Samir. I just <laughs> sipped water as you said that. No, no worries. Um, so tell me, um, I had the, the privilege, the immense privilege of being on your podcast a little while ago, and you've been doing great work, uh, especially I've been enjoying the Civilizations um, series that you've been doing. Um, but before we get to that, why don't you tell me a little bit about your personal history? So, so you're born and raised in Canada or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my parents are from Kerala in India, uh, Malayalis. Um, they came to Canada pretty early in the when they started allowing brown people to come to Canada. So I think they came here in like seven, 1971 or something like that. So, um, and uh, Pierre Trudeau, I think was a big, I don't know if he was prime minister at that time. I think he was, um, but in any case, that's my name. My name comes from Justin Trudeau. So my, my dad was uh, really a big fan of Pierre Trudeau and he heard that his son was, named Justin. And so some time later when I was born, he was like, yeah, I'm going to name him Justin. Wait, wait so, a sec, wait a sec. You're named after the current prime minister of Canada? I, I'm named after the current prime minister of Canada. That is perhaps the most hilarious thing I've ever heard. <laughs> yeah. um, cool. So they came, yeah, coincidentally, my parents also um, came to North America in 1971. Um, was it easy for them? Did they, did they have government jobs? What did they, what did they end up doing? Yeah, they had government jobs. It was like a point system, but like, yeah, my dad became a social worker. He went to York actually. He, they had studied in Germany. They, they both were in Germany for a little bit and then they came to straight to Toronto. Um, and my dad, yeah, became a social worker for the city of Toronto, like a welfare caseworker, actually. So he ended up taking early retirement in um, 1995, shortly after 1995, during the so-called common sense revolution in Ontario, when the really right-wing government started to cut welfare to the point where he, you know, he kind of signed on to help people. <laughs> and he was like, this is like, my job has gone from 
helping people to kind of monitoring people and making sure they don't get benefits as opposed to getting them. So, yeah. but then my mom's a nurse, classic Kerala nurse story. So, mm. so it sounds to me like um, your parents probably already had some kind of political understanding, political training. And did you grow up with in that sort of an environment? Because most of us, yeah. I mean, I don't want to generalize, but many of us South yeah. Asians, um, like our parents didn't necessarily have progressive politics. Yeah, you know, Kerala has a strong communist party. The communists are in power now. They were uh, the incumbents. So they just won an election in Kerala. Um, you know, they've been in and out of, of power in Kerala since the 50s. So my parents, I don't think, were communists or party people or activists per se. But um, it's just not a taboo. Like when I was 12 or 13, I like, read the Bible because my parents are Christian. Uh, you know, I like read the Bible that was on their shelf and I was like, this is absurd. I <laughs> probably shouldn't get too into my religious lack of beliefs, but I, I, I kind of like told my mom, I was like, mom, I don't believe in this stuff. And she was like, oh, I get it. You're a communist. <laughs> so, so, you know, she just, you know, she knows communists, she knows what their yeah. beliefs are. So she, she wasn't like, oh, you, you know, you, this is some, I've never heard of anything like this. How could you have this take on things? So, yeah. Yeah, fascinating um, stuff. Um, so it's not a taboo, I guess. In Kerala, right? Like in lots of parts of the world, anti-communism is is very strong. And like, you can just say the word communist and that's like, um, but that's not the case in Kerala. I guess, I mean, in India even more broadly, I mean, there's obviously a lot of anti-communism in India, but uh, yeah. there's still, you know, communist parties yeah, in, you know, in parliaments and so on. Oh, the other thing is there is a York connection. I work at York now. My dad went to York as an adult, you know, like uh, adult learner to get his uh, bachelor of social work, I think, maybe even his psychology degree. And some of the books that he had on his shelf from York, you know, like there's a 70s book from Monthly Review called The Pillage of the Third World. And <laughs> You know, there's a bunch of like uh, the other America by Michael Harrington. Like I remember seeing these as a as a teenager and kind of picking them up and reading them. And again, it's like it's not so much a a question of like being indoctrinated as for me, it's just like this is not a taboo subject. You know, this is like something that you're allowed to think about and talk about. And you know, there are normal people <laughs> that are that are left wing and. Yeah. And communists. So was there a moment for you when you sort of, um, cause many of us um, do have a particular incident, a particular story where we sort of realized that we were being lied to for many, many years and that we couldn't believe what we read in the newspaper and that reading the monthly review might be a better way to go. Um, so <laughs> did, did you have a, a moment when well, that sort of shifted for you or was it gradual? Yeah, I think for me, it was more um, like attain attainable ideals um in the sense that like when i was a teenager i read a lot of gandhi like i read hind swaraj and i read about gandhi i read biographies and i read a bunch of like when i was like 17 or 18 because i you know mr powers history class <laughs> i took mr powers grade 11 and grade 13 history classes so this is just in case you watch or listen to civilization series. I it's a series on history with my former high school history teacher. So his classes were also very much like the same spirit. It's like he's not necessarily a raging communist. You can probably tell by listening, but he is not. He, it's not a taboo for him. Like he's happy to teach like Lenin or Mao or you know anarchists or whatever among the other Western thinkers and leaders of the times. Yeah. Um, I mean, oh, it reminds I, me, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I mean, it reminds me just coming up because I studied philosophy at McGill um, and there was a guy there whose name I'm sort of blanking on, Italian guy who's an expert on Hegel. And uh, he described when he first taught Marx, so he taught us Marx, um, but when he first taught Marx, this would have been 95, 96, when he first taught Marx in Canada in the 80s, he was like one of the first people to do so. And he describes... Mm -hmm a sort of backlash that happened that he really wasn't expecting because, you know, he's, he's a yeah, specialist in Italy. I mean, he's a specialist in 19th century German idealism. Like, and he is, he's, what are you going <laughs> to, yeah. how are you going to, how are you going to teach around that? Without yeah, mentioning I mean, he is, he is one of the, I mean, even, I think even today he's still alive. One of, he's today, he's one of the best um, Merleau-Ponty and Hegel scholars 
in the world. And so, yeah, Marx is just part of that milieu. So yeah, kind of have to teach it. And it, he was just surprised that it was such a big deal and it made him push even harder. <laughs> on yeah, yeah. Academia. So, but I, that is to say that in Canada in, in the 80s and 90s, there were people who were openly discussing uh, different kinds of threats. Yeah, so unlike, that's what unlike I was going to say. I, I asked my dad recently now, my dad's, you know, in his 70s now. And I asked him, I was like, so tell me something, because I work at York now. I was like, tell me something. Who was your most like influential professor at York? What was your best? And he mentioned this professor named Wilson Head. He was like, I don't know. There was one guy named Wilson Head who came from the States. And I looked up this Wilson Head. He's fascinating. He's like, you know, founder of like a race relations uh, committee and like op opposed the Vietnam War. He was like physically attacked um, for being like a black activists um, so yeah it's just it's just you know, I found it interesting how you know I kind of like ended up back at York <laughs> and, and like on the left at York after my dad went to York yeah. and studied these things in the 70s but what I was going to say was like in terms of attainable goals because uh, yeah like Gandhi I was like okay what am I going to do with this am I going to you know, like doff my clothes and spin some homespun and like, you know, sit on agitation and go on hunger strike. But then uh, it was like first year university at University of Toronto when I like uh, discovered on a bookshelf Chomsky's uh, Deterring Democracy. And then I was like, OK, like here's somebody who's a professor who's like writing stuff. And I was like, I could uh, this I could do like this is something I could actually do. This is this is achievable in in uh, you know in in the real world yeah so i just want to take a moment because chomsky is definitely part of my story as well and say like the number of people so i'll tell you my chomsky story very briefly um mm -hmm. so i was kind of a um, relatively apathetic like first year university student who was i mean kind of lost looking back on it didn't know what the hell i was doing in his life um and a friend of mine was like let's go see Chomsky he's speaking at, at the the big you know undergrad thing and I was like yeah I've heard about Chomsky some vague linguist from Boston or something okay cool uh, I had no idea what I was getting into actually he he talked about this was two days after the Oslo Accords were signed so it must have been 94 um and he gave a whole like Palestine rundown which I you know me coming from Washington DC I had never heard anything like that analysis and, um, you know, it was a big part of my own sort of coming to consciousness process. Um, but I mean, just the effect that this guy, I mean, he's, he's now in his 90s, I think we have to sort of uh, tip our hat a little bit. The number of people who have been radicalized or who's, uh, he's been part of their political education is like, it's unimaginable. Yeah, it was like, it was like, um, yeah, I have some, I, I've been having like flashbacks from those days. Like my father would read the Globe and Mail and I would read it, you know, it would be on the kitchen table. Like he would, he drove me, we lived in Mississauga. He would drive, he, he was driving to the office uh, in uh, Etobicoke, the welfare office, whatever. And he would drive me to the subway and then I would take the subway to U of T and go to the library, go to my classes. And then I would take the bus home. And so part of that was like, he would read the paper and then I would read the paper as he was reading the paper in the morning. And I would just get so angry all the time about the bullshit in the paper, you know, like I, I, I didn't have like a solid analysis of what it was about. And I didn't know, but I was like tripping up on all kinds of propaganda and all these racist assumptions. And I was into like economics at that time too. So there was a lot of deficit stuff like a lot of like we have to pay this deficit and i was like what is this deficit like the, the people talk about the deficit like it's some kind of religious duty to pay the deficit and i i just um when i found chomsky it was just like so clear compared to that you know it was like somebody who was not trying to bullshit you at all and that was that was the feeling that i got i was like holy shit this is like you can just tell the truth in a, yeah. in in the written word, like in a, you can just do. And he he did this thing. I, I think it was the deterring democracy, but he was like, you know, they refer to four freedoms, like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, blah blah blah. And then he was like, but they never talk about the fifth freedom, which is like to steal and murder, <laughs> whatever. And I was like, oh my god, like that. Reading that when I was eighteen was like, wow. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. No, for sure. And, and there was something about his style, like, and, and I want, I'm, I'm sort of speaking to you now as a writer. Um, 
you know, there's something about his style that was just very refreshing compared because it wasn't it wasn't that it lacked nuance when there needed to be nuance. You know, when he he was talking about um, whatever it may have been, like like the Indonesian occupation of East Timor or whatever, like he could give you every single detail in 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 high definition in his prose. But there was a, a no BS kind of quality to that that. At the time, I mean, now with the internet, I think people are a bit spoiled because you can almost find anything you're looking for. But at the time, it's like, we didn't have anyone who spoke to us like that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and now, like, now that I'm able to look, it's like you said, uh, like looking back at the internet and looking back at history, I can see even where he learned some of these things. And it does go back to Marx. Like you can, like a lot, one of Chomsky's big tricks is like by this logic, right? Like, oh, well, if you think this is true, then this has to be true. And you, I was reading Marx on the opium war and he has this passage where he's like, well, would we accept, you know, Paris sending a fleet up the Thames just to talk? (laughs) Would we be like, oh yeah, of course, they're just here to talk. That's why they sent this huge armed fleet, right? Um, so it was just, I was like, oh my God, this is what Chomsky does. And it makes sense, right? Because Chomsky did grow up in a Marxist uh, framework, but we didn't, right? Like we didn't no, for sure. grow up in that tradition, so. No, for sure. And, and for me, like just reflecting on that, like um, Marx is big and I don't want to downplay Marx, but, but that kind of analysis started before Marx and continues in parallel with Marx as well. So it's like, it's sometimes I, I feel like we, and I, I don't mean we by you and me, I mean the left in general. I mean, like, I feel like we we downplay this by using Marx too much. And Marx started in the, Marx as a 19th century figure. And when we do that, we forget, you know, all this stuff that came before, the anti-imperialist movements that started as soon as imperialism started, <laughs> like, you know, the diggers and the liberal levelers and the whole, you know, the, you know, so there's a lot of history that you have very well gone on to in, in, in your podcast. Yeah. That um, that you know that articulates this tradition really well, and it's a big strain through, um, you know, as as Chomsky would say, starting with the Enlightenment itself. Yeah, for sure. But there's something about the volume and the the she- like. There's something about Marx where he's just so <laughs> like his style too, right? Stylistically, like the way that he talks about people that he doesn't like is very entertaining. <laughs> I mean, you know, a lot of the people you mentioned you know, like Toussaint Louverture or, you know, the Haitian Revolution, these are like major, much more important figures in the scheme of things than people who write books. But these are people of action and we know about them because of writers. Like I know about Toussaint Louverture because C.L.R. James and C.L.R. James is another person we could talk about, like, which I only discovered after Chomsky. Like you have to then yeah, go on. No, this is fantastic. And, and again, thanks for your work. Uh, I want to talk a little bit now. I want to pivot and talk a little bit about uh, one particular piece of your work. So a couple of years ago, I think it was in 2019, you published a book called, um, well, why don't you tell us about, about that novel? Oh, <laughs> Siege Breakers. Yeah. It's called Siege Breakers. And it's about, it's basically pre- imagining how the, how the siege on Gaza, the Israeli siege on Gaza could end. So I was sort of like, trying to speculate write a piece of speculative fiction about the end of like a, a just end you know not like utopia but like a just an end to the siege and what it would take to make that happen and I wanted to write it as a fan of the thriller genre <laughs> I, I wanted to write it as a thriller so I wrote it kind of like as a thriller like a military story where yeah. the Palestinians are the good guys which I had never seen anywhere um, written yeah. either so. Before we get to the second half and the sort of possible future part of it, tell me a little bit about your process for writing that book. Because what I notice in going through some of the reviews online is that people from Palestine are praising this as like a good description of their daily lives. And and I mean, there must have been some work that went into that. Yeah, I went to Gaza in 2002. Uh, I went to Janine, I went to Gaza, I was, I joined the so-called International Solidarity Movement, the ISM. I had been writing or working on it, on the issue for two years, about two years, well, a year and a half, two years, because since the second intifada started in September of 2000, and I was working at Zenet, again, Chomsky, right? Like, because of Chomsky, I got into this, the pl- place that he was writing mostly for the internet was on Zenet. 
and I like basically became a volunteer there and started writing uh, for them too. And when uh, when the first second intifada started, we started this kind of like Middle East Watch kind of page uh, w where we collected people, you know, people who were writing about it. And then I heard about ISM that way, and I went uh, that summer of 2002. So Gaza was even back then more intense than Janine or Jerusalem or the other parts of the West Bank. And uh, yeah, so um, it was all, it's been on my mind ever since. And then in 2005, the settlers left Gaza and they really sealed it in. And then they've just been, the Israelis have just been continuously attacking it ever since. Yeah. So I've, I, I think it was like 2006, there was a big war. 2008, nine, there was a big war. 2012, there was something a little bit smaller in the scheme of things. And 2014 was the biggest one. 2014, I, I like, I was so frustrated by that. Like I was just so felt so enraged and so like helpless and uh, I guess I, I think that's usually when I start writing. <laughs> um, that's like usually the place that I write from. So I just, there were like, my, my kid was just born, um, you know, he was small. And uh, in the evenings after he would go to sleep, I would just start, I just started writing. And I just, I, I would just, you know, just see things. This is what fiction for me is like, you just see scenes. And for me, it was like, I think from the previous war, there was this kidnapping, kidnapping. It was like a prisoner of war. There was a, there was a tank gunner. Uh, I think his name was Shalit. And he was, he was captured by the Palestinian resistance. And he kind of like would come in and out of, um, maybe it was 2006, but anyway, he would come in and out of the news and people in Israel, I gather, were really con concerned that he was starting to identify with the Palestinians a little bit. And so I think when he was eventually released, he was just like taken completely off the air because I think he was he was not like on some. So anyway, I had this like funny thought in my mind that kept going where I was like, what if he was like secretly, you know, orchestrating the whole thing? And then I, I thought like, oh, this could be like the basis for a huge, you know, a, a much bigger story about. And then and then in the process, it was like, there's like a political goal to go with the aesthetic goal, which is like, I want people to read this and be like seduced into identifying completely with the Palestinian side here. And also, you know, there's a, there's a very prominent Israeli character. And so I, I think I handle the Israeli side, you know, I know the Israeli side very well. I know lots of Israelis there, you know, I have lots of Israeli friends too. I'm not like, as, as do many, 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 many Palestinians, honestly. Um, it's no surprise to people who actually know. Uh, so, yeah. but yeah, that's, that's, I guess that's what the thinking that went into it. That's fantastic. And um, I haven't made my way through the whole book, but it's, it's I just want to point out that, you know, sometimes political fiction is like very heavy handed and um, the writing isn't necessarily of the best quality and, and people sort of lose the plot because they're trying to make a point. You didn't fall into that trap. And you think they should read mine anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. You didn't fall into that trap at all. It is um, tur a page-turning stuff. Um, it's a good thriller. Um, you know, worth reading on its own merits. Um, so I want to go back to Siege Breakers in a little bit. But before we do, I think just given where we are right now, it's been um, 10 days or so. Um, maybe less. Sorry, I've lost track. Um, but it's, it's been, it's been a bit more than a week since, um, well, actually, I don't know when to start the timeline. <laughs> there's, there's a long yeah, timeline. Right. There's a since long time. It's been considerably <laughs> more than a week. Yeah. Um, but even this, even this latest agitation. So, um, I mean, I'm going to give a very broad outline and, and if you could fill in what's been going on, because you know, the situation far better than I do. So the very broad outline is that there was forced evictions as there often are, um, Usually, the forced evictions don't really make the headlines because they aren't they aren't in prominent places, they, and they're not you know next to pl places that have infrastructure and next to media and all that kind of stuff. These were forced evictions in 
um, in a, an Arab district in Jerusalem, which um, settlers, are, which Zionist settlers have been trying to sort of get their hands on for a long, long time. Um, that started, that's one part of the story. Another part of the story is um, an ultra national, I don't know how to describe them, like a very right wing uh, Zionist group was going to, they march every year to Al-Aqsa, they were going to do it this year. The day of their march was corresponding very closely with the end of Ramadan and the beginning of Eid. And that caused all kinds of problems as well. So that's another thread. And then there's a third thread, which is sort of where we are now, which is that the, the uh, Hamas, which is the ruling, ruling authority, uh, the democratic, democratically elected authority in, in Gaza, they threatened and then did launch some rockets, which then sparked this Israeli response that we're seeing right now. So have I got the story sort of more or less right? Yeah, I mean, the only, only, that the, the only thing I would add is that the rockets were launched by Hamas because of what was going on in Jerusalem. So there was like a, there was like a warning of like, Hamas did this thing where they were like, you know, you've got to stop these evictions and you've got to stop this violence in Jerusalem. And uh, if not, we're going to do this. And uh, so it was, it was, um, and there, that, like, I just wanted to say that to kind of underscore the conscious decision that's supported by m the m people in Gaza, despite the horrible suffering. Like nobody's saying Hamas shouldn't have done this uh, because, you know, it's it was going to bring terrible Israeli reprisal. They yeah. knew that it was going to, and they were still like, you know, th they're Palestinians of Jerusalem that are being thrown out their lands. We have to do something. Yeah. Um, I think that's a point that we, we should probably emphasize, which is that, um, <clears throat> so I, I guess some people will say, what about sort of nonviolent resistance? Um, but let, let's, let's leave those people aside for a second and, and just point out that, um, you know, this is the only form of solidarity that is really open to the people of Palestine is some kind of resistance. And well, yeah. And then yeah. if they, we can, we can point to the March of return, which was like a non, a massive nonviolent movement that resulted in Israelis just freely, you know, shooting them down from the other side of the fence. Right. Yeah. And there's been nonviolent yeah. attempts to break the, break the blockade of Gaza. I mean, there's the nonviolence is sort of a daily thing. Um, but in yeah. terms of what yeah. the, what the actual government of Gaza can do, this is pretty much all they can do. And they have, they have, if they had targeted weapons, <laughs> they could, yeah. they, yeah. they might be able to do something that was a little bit more tactically. Um, someone, someone from the Chapo uh, Trap House podcast said that they were like, you're making an argument for why Hamas should have an air force and, uh, yeah. and targeted weapons. Cause that's the only, you know, yeah. if you're criticizing their lack of targeting them. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So um, you pointed out, and I agree 100% that this is a pattern. So, um, and and in fact, in, in Israeli documents, they're quite clear about that this is, I, I can't forget the term they use, mow the, mow the lawn or something. I mean, like they, they do this from time to time just because they can. Um, and they do it, when they do it in, in Gaza, it's very easy for them because they can blame Hamas. Like it's, it's um, and, and Hamas because of, you know, some quirks to do with their charter can always be painted as, as this, rabid anti-Semitic force. No one ever points out, by the way, that the Likud Charter, so the, the Bibi Netanyahu's party, has a charter that, you know, is just as genocidal as the, you know. If you, if well, yeah, and Hamas changed their, they, I think like some, quite a few years ago, they've actually, they actually finally changed their charter. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't say not, that not that the Israelis care, but. No, they still refer to it in the same way. So, it, yeah. Um, anyway, so, so that's the context within which Israel does this. Um, and it's been going on for a long time, many of us have predicted that this will have to end sooner or later. Um, but every year or every couple of years, it just seems to get worse. So what's your take on the sort of pattern of violence? Yeah, I mean, the so I, I, I try to rein my own despair in by remembering, for example, that, you know, the it has been getting steadily worse, but it has, um, it did have a start point, right? Like Gaza wasn't always walled off. Uh, it wasn't always besieged. Um, and it always it wasn't always like just the sole focus of all of Israel's firepower. And I think part of what's happening is, 
like the dynamics are changing because I think Israel would have gone and tried to do a ground war. Uh, they tried to do it in 2014 and they were very unsuccessful. They had a couple of big ambushes where some of their equipment was destroyed. And this, this is uh this is also, there are scenes in siege breakers that kind of replicate this uh, dynamic. And so the, the rockets, if the rockets are sufficiently disruptive of, you know, beach life, uh, summer life, tourism, um, airport travel, etc., then, yeah, then maybe there will be eventually some kind of decision where it's like, you know, you can commit genocide on the people of Gaza, but you can't do it while simultaneously enjoying your beach life and your shopping malls to the fullest. So maybe you should stop the genocide and then, <laughs> you know, uh, so I, I, I guess, I guess like there is a, the only thing that's changing in the equation or that has potential to change in the equation seems to be the, what the resistance is, the resistance's capabilities. I wish, and this is like, gets back to the nonviolence question. I wish that because it's it's like nonviolent po political um, change is based on a certain theory, right? Like Orwell wrote about it a little bit. Gandhi obviously talked about it. The idea is, you know, you need a lot of media and then you do this thing in front of the media and you show the world you're suffering and then it, you know, growing numbers of people force their governments through democratic theory of change to change. But like, as far as the Palestinians go, they have held up their end of the bargain in terms of nonviolence, but the liberal um, support for them in the West that was supposed to save them was not forthcoming. And the media is not forthcoming and the po political class is not forthcoming. So, and that applies to left, you know, Latin, like meet centrist and right wing. Yeah. Uh, media and and polit politics across the West. So if yeah. that's true, and and I I don't know, like I don't know what I no longer have, like I don't know what it would take for a majority of Western or or a portion of the Western media and po political class to be willing to make some sacrifice to stop yeah. this massacre in Gaza. But yeah. I I don't I'm not seeing it. Yeah. I'm not seeing I it. I haven't talked with uh, with Noam with with Chomsky for. I think it was the 2008 bombing of Gaza was the last time I talked with him. But he he took the discussion in a place that I just wasn't expecting uh, at the time. But now I, I I'm happy. Now I I think he's right, and I'm happy to talk about it with you. Which is that there's a reason for that. I mean, the reason is that the history of what Israel is doing in Palestine mimics so closely what the history of Canada mimics so closely the history of the U.S. Um, I think that's one strain of it. So settler colonialism mimics the history of South Africa, where I'm speaking to you from. Um, so I think there's one strain we could talk about that is the settler colonial strain, but there's another strain, which is the Islamophobic strain. And I, I think they both come together in a very dangerous way in this particular instance. instance yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's, you know, I, I completely, I completely agree with that. And I think, uh, you know, and both of those have long histories. Uh, I also think I'm I'm writing about this now. I've been I've been trying to write about it for many years, but again, when you reach this, when I reach the place of like total despair, is when I'm most productive in terms of writing. Um, but I I want to I've been wanting to write this for a while. It's like a sp there's also a specifically anti-Palestinian racism. And that there's its own dynamic, uh, and it has to do with this support for Israel. But it's like all these asymmetries, all the like we're so primed for it. And it's like when you've been watching it for a long time, it's almost funny. Like the whole uh, Israelis, like it, one Israeli is killed, two hundred Palestinians die in clashes or like in fighting, and it's like that's the way it's reported, and it's like super suspicious if you don't know and if you do know it's just like this absolute commitment to use the passive voice to confuse agency like who's actually doing what to who 
but you know, th those aren't those aren't the cause for what's going on because we know media know how to use the active voice. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and, <laughs> wait a sec, wait a sec, wait a second. You're telling me that, that uh, New, the New York Times knows how to write English? Is that what you're telling me? Yeah, they know the New York Times knows how to write English. So then, uh, it's more of a symptom of what's going on than the cause, and those, the cause is actually. Um, yeah, it's it's anti-Palestinian racism. And I, I do, in my cup forthcoming essay, I'm going to announce it now to force myself to do it. <laughs> but in my forthcoming essay, I do make a distinction between Islamophobia because um, one of the problems with identifying it with as the Muslim, with the Muslim cause, is that what happens is they, they're able to find Muslims who then endorse Sacred. Israel. And then it's oh, like, yeah. well, we've found Muslim Jewish, whatever. right? Muslim Jewish coexistence societies that have nothing to do with Palestine or Palestinians and totally ignore their, their struggle. Yeah, so, so for me, I mean, I, I want to bring it back to the colonial side because, you know, I have my own criticisms and I know you have your criticisms of like the Ottoman Empire and the Safavids and like all these, these dynasties. But the fact is like, um, compare it to the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> like those things were not exactly. were not anti. It's not comparable. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they, they did. They were not anti-Semitic to the extent that, that Christianity was by any stretch. No, of the that's the thing, right? So, so this thing that happened in the Ottoman Empire that we talked about in civilizations, where all these Europe once the Ottoman Empire kind of got weak enough after six hundred years, but like all the European powers started asserting themselves as protectors of minority faiths. So it was like France is the protector of the Catholics, Russia is the protector of the Orthodox, and England is the protector of the Jews. And it's like, how the hell did England become the protector of the Jews? They were the first power in Europe to expel the Jews. Um, you know, and so it, it it's, it, yeah, it's a, it's a fascinating but it's, story. I mean, to me, to, to, in terms of my own academic work, I mean, this is where I distinguish between, I suppose, different colonial or different sort of imperialist models. And to me, Western European, settler colonialism is a different entity or colonialism in general is a different entity and is yeah. is actually um, like quantifiably worse yeah. than something like the Ottoman Empire or so on. Like I'm not saying yeah. the Ottoman Empire was good. I wouldn't necessarily want to live there, but, no, the, the, but I the definitely wouldn't want to regime. live in Inquisition Spain. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. The, the property regime, the, the racialism, the, the, way they, the way they do propaganda is different, right? Like the import, the way they emphasize like brainwashing and rewriting history and- For sure. And, and lies. And that's um, like, that's another, one of the, one of their lies is that they're no different from anybody else. So it's, <laughs> even that is part of their system to say, oh, Ottomans, you know, empires rise, empires fall. It's just part of history. And it's like, no, the, the Anglo-American thing is different. Like it's only the Anglo-American thing you know, we've had thousands, maybe tens of thousands of years of empires, but we're only reaching like the limits of the earth's capacity to handle them under the Anglo-American regime, right? We only started like the incredible deforestation, the climate change, the fossil fuel burning, the, like all these things are, we've, we've even had genocides before. Like we've had huge massacres before, but we haven't had this level of, and that's, that's an Anglo-American thing. That's no, for sure. And I think the sort of um, what we sometimes term as ethnic cleansing, or um, if there's a more polite term, I can't think of it right now. But so if we take, for example, um, uh, one context that I'm, I'm more familiar with in the Palestinian context is the Indian context. And there's this myth that, um, you know, that we talk about in my organization, Peace Vigil, we talk about how him, there's this myth that Hindus and Muslims have always been fighting. But the first time that actually happens, and there's no coincidence here, is about, I'm going to get the exact date wrong, but it's roughly about 20 or 30 years after the British defeat Aurangzeb for the first time, right? So the British are, are getting a seat and it's exactly in the area where they defeated. The British have been in control in this area for 20, 30 years. That's when we see the first communal riot. So I, I don't think that's a coincidence. No, they have they have quite a lot of literature internally where they're like, we need to do more of this. This is working. Let's divide Hindus and you know Muslims, whatever. Like they 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 do that. They're they're very explicit about it. It's not a yeah, it's not a conspiracy theory. It's just a it's just a known history that's been uh, kind of repressed. Um, but yeah, like even in 1857 in those episodes, there's like so much Hindu Muslim fighting together 
against uh, against yeah. the British. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to do a multi-part um, podcast on that very soon because um, awesome. the anniversary of the death of, of uh, Rani Lakshmi Bai is, is coming up. So we're going to do a little bit, um, going to go a little bit deta- into detail on the women who fought against the British in 1857. Yeah, those are incredible, incredible it's stories. Amazing stories, yeah. Cool, man. So, so um, what I'm hearing is that the situation in Gaza is... Um, is volatile. I mean, in some ways, you know, when I listen to your podcast with uh, your friends, you did a roundtable podcast that was published yesterday. Um, in some ways, I came out more hopeful from that than I thought I would. Yeah. Because yeah, what John. I heard from what I heard from John is that yeah. there is a method. So it's sort of like in the 1950s and 60s in the US, like, you know, you listen to someone like Chomsky talk about that history. It's like, yeah, we knew we we're losing. We knew it sucked. But there was a method of fighting. We had organizing. We had unions. We had a way to fight back. And what I'm hearing about the analysis of Gaza right now is that there's a methodology, there's a way to fight the Israeli occupiers that that probably did not exist before that. Do you agree with that analysis? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I, I you know, you do you do have to understand it in the in the context of the region. And you know, I've heard people say that you know the Arab world is like the the India of the 19th century, like today's Arab world, the U.S. is doing kind of like what the British Empire was doing in the 19th century to India and like keep it divided and, you know, have little <laughs> make make alliances, use I mean, one part of it against another. Iraq is kind of a case study on that, eh? Exactly. Exactly. So we have like we have different, uh, you know, there's one 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 analysis goes like this. It's crude, but it's like you have a you have a Muslim brotherhood axis which is like qatar turkey pakistan which is not part of the arab world but you know bear with me um you have uh you have um the the egyptian muslim brotherhood which has been pretty thoroughly crushed um in egypt and then you have a wahhabi axis right which is saudis um and all of their influence uh all over you know isis al-qaeda and then you have the so-called resistance axis which is like iran the iraqi militias hezbollah and hamas and at one point hamas was sort of closer to the brotherhood axis but um you know them rejoining the resistance axis is part of like part and and the like hezbollah had a lot of success against israel in 2006 to the point where you could argue there's been some level of deterrence where Israel doesn't really want to do it. as much as they can destroy Lebanon. They know they can't occupy Lebanon. Um, and they know that they're going to face a lot of rocket fire should they decide to do that. And so can Hamas get to that level, right? Could, um, and, and apparently what I've been uh, researching recently is like Iran... Iran's way of sponsoring these resistance groups is not to just supply them the way the U.S. supplies Saudi Arabia with weapons. Iran's all about them being able to develop their own capacity. Wow. So, so if they, you know, whatever level they're at is the level they're at, and Iran will help them uh, with know-how and so on, but they can't, they don't want to you know, put put supplies out over routes that can be intercepted and whatnot. Or that can be just bombed to smithereens. I mean, which is what <laughs> right. Okay, yeah. So whatever whatever Hamas is able to do now, or you know, I shouldn't say Hamas, whatever the resistance is able to do now in Gaza, it's the it's it's what they can do. It's their level given their context. So as they if they're on a trajectory to being able to do more, then again we can hope that Israel will yeah come to its senses and in some ways this is like um i don't want to call it a good thing but it's sort of a fortuitous side effect of the siege because if you got nothing and this is like self-sufficiency in general like the, gaza has no choice but to be yeah. self if it's going to be defended it's going to defend itself if it's going to have food it's going to feed itself like it and it's not a big area it's this tiny little place um that has somehow and and it's pretty you know fair fair number of people um, so everyone needs um, work, everyone needs bread, everyone needs whatever food they can get, um, and they have to do it on their own. And they have, yeah, I mean, and, and they can do it on their own. What they can't do is, 
I mean, no human being can do is like do it with Israel just bombing everything every few years, which is what is, you know, happening. That's what makes the situation so untenable. And that's why it's like, you know, you, even a ceasefire is not really in their interest at this point, because it's like a ceasefire where they continue to be in this prison where they don't have a port, they can't travel, they can't get things in and out. Like that's not, that's just a continuation of the war, right? That's not, that's also not, allowed <laughs> like, yeah, or crazy. it wouldn't be allowed in any yeah i mean international law seems to have no meaning so joke, I, yeah, I, yeah I, I worked for amnesty international for several years so it's yeah touchy, i mean it's like it's it's about as meaningful as the british you know like who is gonna go appeal to the british empire on international law grounds like yeah that's not yeah. so i want to ask you like when i lived in um canada in the 90s like, it's not that the Palestinian cause didn't have uh, supporters. It did have some, but it wasn't very mainstream. Um, and I suspect what's happened since that time is that, A, the diaspora has grown, like the number of people and the number of educated people and the number of people who are sort of visible um, and who have some tie to Palestine has just grown. Um, but I also hope that the this, not so much the governments, but the civil society as a whole has sort of got more politicized and organized. Do you think at least we're at a point where we can, where you guys in Canada can influence governments to, to back away from their pro-Zionist positions? No, unfortunately I don't, but I, you know, I do think again, like there are certain things that I think there's a trend, um, but each, each time there's an attack like this, I'm like, Oh, maybe that maybe we've gotten far along a lot, far enough along along the trend line to see a change. And it doesn't, look that way i don't i think israel will be able to count on canada for you know probably the foreseeable future i mean i i was i've been really <laughs> you know i've been really disappointed in the ndp but that's like part of what that's part of political life in canada is to be disappointed in the ndp that's like what it means to be a leftist in canada but like you don't really i mean the liberals or conservatives nobody even you don't have, you know, you can't, you'd be a fool to have any hope in those um, no. parties, right? So it's, it, and then, yeah, and then the media, it's, it seems like, you know, like you said, the demographics do change, but co optation is the key engine of colonialism, right? Like it's, it's not, it's more about getting people to do <laughs> imperialist stuff for you than it is to have like white people do racist stuff like that's just that's always been a small relatively smaller part of colonialism if canada completely changed its tune on israel i don't think that would be enough for no, israel to yeah it so it's all it's only it's only the united states that and, yeah. and the united states can can do it in an afternoon right i mean that would... so so let's talk about that so i mean you know again from my um, very difficult days trying to lobby Capitol Hill on this issue. I mean, and in those days, there was not a single soul that I could talk to on this. Um, now there are some, there's even a Palestinian member of Congress, uh, Rashida Thaib, Um, And there are others who have talked some sense. I mean, Bernie Sanders, maybe not as much sense as I would like, but at least he's sort of moving in the right direction. Um, what's your take on the politics in the US? I also think that I, I'm not optimistic about that. A lot of people are more optimistic than me, but I, I just think, I think saying it's, it's a lot like Medicare for all. It's a lot like any progressive policy in the U S there'll, there'll be, there's like a little bit of like dangling this in front of you to get you to stick with the, their program. So, you know, Biden, whatever, whatever is going on in Biden's head, like Biden before, before he got to this mental state, he was an unequivocal supporter of Israel who criticized Republicans for insufficient support of Israel. Um, and, you know, yeah, okay, there's, there's people in Congress that are saying, you know, there should be a ceasefire, but, you know, whatever it is that they, yeah, whatever they're saying, it's, I think it's sort of like, trying to appeal to all sides of their so-called base. Um, 
equally. So they, they, they've got something for the pro-Israel people, you know, which is $3.8 billion a year worth of aid and unequivocal support at the United Nations and so on. And then for the Palestine people, they'll get some of their lefty Congress people to say, oh, well, there should be a ceasefire. But, yeah. you know. Yeah, I wish I could say I didn't share your cynicism. Yeah. That would be a lie. Um, yeah, I don't think we should have those kinds of illusions. You know, I, I, I really feel like hoping for hoping for politicians to say something like we like what we what they would have to say is, you know, Netanyahu is under arrest. You know, <laughs> like Netanyahu is under arrest for war crimes. And yeah, then, I mean, there's one theory that the reason that this played out the way that it did and with the timing that it did is to stop Netanyahu from going to jail for corruption charges, right? Because he was, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah domestic politics in Israel was turning against him. He was about to lose his coalition. And once he's no longer yeah. prime minister, he might have to serve jail time. Yeah. Um, so this that, is, but this... that narrative has been completely lost. <laughs> no mm. one seems to remember that. Yeah. But like that, I mean, it's it's true and it's cynical and it's horrific that somebody like that would be willing to kill hundreds or thousands of people for his political career. Of course it's true, but like that wouldn't help in the sense that the people like Netanyahu is the left wing of the governing coalition in Israel right now. There are, there are people more, far more right wing than him. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah and that like, you're, uh, well, I guess what I'm saying is, <laughs> you know, the West, uh, Israel, um, these are not going to be where, these are not going to be where change is going to come from. Like, yeah. and, and like the, the, the theory that these are where the change is going to come from in Palestine has actually led to, I think, some perverse, like, expectations on the Palestinians to be like, oh, you guys should stop firing rockets or you guys should you know, yeah. do this or that and be the perfect nonviolent victim so that we can sell this, uh, we can yeah. sell this program to our public. And you haven't sold, the, we haven't sold this program to the public, yeah. the public, you know, so, so there's no, again, the nonviolence thing, we're not, the West has not fulfilled its end of the bargain. Yeah, let me just, um, because I'm located here in South Africa, and I've been working with um, South African BDS activists on and off for a few years. Um, and let me just point out that, you know, South Africa is often held up as a role model, like look at what they did in terms of, you know, suffering in jail and nonviolent resistance. And um, I just want to point out that's, and you know this, I know, but that's not how history happened. <laughs> there, there was a hot war, like there was live munition fired. And if it wasn't for Cuba, you know, defeating yeah. the forces of apartheid in Angola and, yeah. you know, Oliver Tambo running basically a kind of a... Um, I mean, you could describe it as a kind of terrorist uh, organizations. I mean, they were hitting soft targets, right? Um, yeah. Because that's what they could do. Yeah. Um, if it that that is a big part of the reason that you know I'm sitting here in a what was you know 20 years ago an all white neighborhood in Johannesburg, and you know I haven't been lynched yet. Like, like it's yeah. it's the violence was part of the solution. I hate to say it, right? But it's yeah. true. No, and but but the thing is, it's it's totally. We hate to say it, but it's like, as liberals, it's totally acceptable to them. Like nobody, like all they can, all liberals can manage to say right now after like 70 children have been vaporized and, you know, hundreds of civilians have been vaporized and they're, they're, you're just watching towers fall down. And they're all saying, well, Israel has a right to defend itself. So they don't have a problem with violence at all. They have no problem with terrorism. They have no problem with violence. They have no problem with violence against civilians. But there's like a standard that Palestinians are supposed to uphold. And in exchange for what? Again, like you can ask that. You can. If you're like, look, you guys take the hits. We'll take hits too. You know, we'll go to jail on your behalf, whatever. Like we're, but as a solidarity movement, there's, I'm, that's not happening. So, yeah. That like it's one thing to say the, the the theory doesn't work, but it's like maybe the theory works and maybe it doesn't. But but according to the theory, you're not doing what you need to be doing. Hundred percent, hundred percent. So, so uh, as we move to the end of the conversation, Justin. So the name of this podcast is Recovery and Transformation, and I think for a lot of us who've been watching, you know, children being pulled from wreckage and you know these kind of horrific scenes, even people who were sort of 
even the liberal center that you're describing, I've seen some people saying like, it's like watching, um, you know, someone fighting with planes and, and missiles against someone fighting with sticks and stones. Like it's just, it's just sort of heartbreaking to watch. So for someone who's seen that and going through these emotions, what do you think practically, you know, what can such a person do to be in solidarity with, uh, with those who are suffering? Well, you know, I, we do have to talk about it. I mean, we do have, like all these seemingly futile things. If that's where we are, this is what we're, this is what we're stuck doing, right? Like we're, if you're in South Africa, or if you're in Canada, or if you're in France or Germany, you know, us you you that's what you do you hand out flyers you go to marches you organize marches you make statements you sign statements like this is what we can do right and it's not none of i don't like all of these things have always as an activist felt like ho horribly not proportional to the problems but that's that's also our lot in life right like that's what we do and if there are lots lots and lots and lots of people doing that then we can talk about like you know, our nonviolent actions and, you know, maybe electing politicians and maybe doing political things, whatever. Um, so yeah, you have, we have to do that. We have to, you know, we have to donate, you know, like whatever money you have donate to Islamic relief or medical aid for Palestinians UK. These are what, uh, Tarek, my, my, the doctor friend that you, uh, you listened to our, he was on our, um, podcast that we did the other day. And I'll put links below to all that stuff. Yeah. So, you know, he, he kind of did this thing where he said, you know, there's the political side, the humanitarian side. So yeah, those are the, it's the same, unfortunately, like it's the same things, activities that feel really ridiculous when there are small numbers of people doing them are actually yeah. very effective when there are huge numbers of people doing them. Um, hundred percent, but yeah, in these times. Yeah. So it's, Justin, in, in your book, um, so in Siege Breakers, what, what you describe a possible future within which this has a happy ending. Can you describe what you, what you wrote and also um, tell us whether, you, whether or not you still believe it, given what you just said? Well, yeah, because it's not that happy of an ending. It's just that Israel comes to terms at the end of the book. And Israel comes to terms at the end of the book because the Palestinian resistance manages to unite across the diaspora and West Bank and Gaza and 48 Israel, which seems to be happening now. Um, so that's one, I had like three things that had to happen because I have three different characters that recur. So there's, uh, there's the Palestinian side where their goal is unity. There's an Israeli defector who's a covert operative. So he, that's how he thinks. And so he's secretly he does a bunch of secret things to help, um, which, you know, that's the thriller. That's the real thriller side. So I won't, you know, go into the details, but um, let's just say there's some support from Israel itself, which is covert in this case, but you could imagine various levels of overt or covert support. And then there's a American protagonists that are also helping in a kind of a covert way, mainly by connecting is the Israelis to the Palestinians who otherwise wouldn't be able to trust each other. <laughs> um, uh, really, the Israeli really wants to talk to the Palestinians, but the Palestinians are not going to like... Anyway, so that's um, those are the three kinds of angles that I've covered. And at the end, there is a war, there's a horrible... It's, it unfolds a lot like it's unfolded in 2014, which is what I was watching, or 2018 or now. Um, but then by the end, they, you know, they kind of, the Israeli general calls the American president and comes out, you know, kind of feeling defeated because he's been told that he's got to kind of call it off and, and, and let the, let, let Gaza have a port and an open border and freedom of movement. And then that's hence the siege breakers um, label on the book. 100%. So it's not, yeah. So it's a complicated it's, ending, but it, at least it's some kind of political resolution. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, like you said, like, this is not going to go on forever like this. It started with something, <laughs> you know. And at the beginning of this, even in 1967, there was, you know, people did have freedom of movement, right? Like, 
Palestinians not having freedom of movement is not a forever thing. It's only been going on for some decades. And so we should be able to imagine a future where Palestinians are like allowed to travel, <laughs> you know, like that, that shouldn't be beyond our ability to imagine um, without like having to guarantee to Israel through extensive investigation that they're not going to be a security threat to Israel, right? Like that, they sh Israelis should have no say at all in Palestinian freedoms and rights and movement. And that, you know, that was the past and that's, you know, has to be the future that we look to as well. 100%. Uh, on that note, Justin Podor, it's been a, been a pleasure. Hope we can do this again sometime. Thanks yeah, for your time. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Justin Podor. If you appreciate this content, please do remember to like, subscribe and comment below. I'm Samir Dasani, a health coach and a PhD student based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Thanks for listening.